So it is uh, my big pleasure to introduce Omar bin Nahid as our today's uh, seminar speaker. Uh, Omar is an assistant professor of geophysics uh, at KFUPM, which is the King Fahd uh, University of Petroleum and Minerals in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he graduated from KAUST, which is uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology with a PhD in Earth uh, Science and Engineering in 2015. And then later he, uh, after jo before joining the QFUPM, he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, also in the Department of Geosciences in uh, Princeton University and uh, uh, writing and science engineering fellow uh, at the Princeton Writing Program. His research interests are broadly in the area of computational geoscience, artificial intelligence, and specifically in automating and improving workflows through the use of smart algorithms uh, for enhanced decision making in subsurface energy systems uh, like geothermal sites. I think you will speak a bit about that a little bit. Uh, his, he co-authored uh, and authored over 50 articles and conference papers, and I'm sure today uh, he will introduce some of those as the topics of uh, today's talk is uh, physics informed machine learning for mm -hmm. physical applications. Omar, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Dennis, for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to connect with you all. Um, unfortunately, we cannot be, you know, uh, we cannot meet in person yet. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we will try to uh, try to uh, make a good use of our time today. So um, as Dennis mentioned, my particular interests are in computational geosciences. So with very broad uh, applications. So I will cover some of those today and would specifically talk about some of the applications pertaining to my work on physics informed machine learning. Uh, now to get things moving, uh, what we are witnessing in, in today's world is uh, what is being dubbed as the fourth industrial revolution, right? And uh, it, it's not always that happens that there is a revolution going on in front of our eyes and we are, we are getting accustomed to more and more of these technological advances that are happening around us. So the difference uh, between the third industrial revolution and the fourth one is how the pace with which technology is progressing and also how technology is merging more and more uh, with our lives, right? So if you talk about technologies like face ID recognition, uh, many of us may be using that, you know, for our smartphones or at other, you know, workplaces and so on, voice activated virtual assistants, healthcare sensors. Uh, you can even now have, uh, a, you know, a hip surgery with a 3D printed hip bone, right? Uh, so all of these things are becoming more and more part of our lives, right? Um, and AI or artificial intelligence is the biggest enabler, I would say, uh, in fourth industrial revolution. Now, while uh, you know, uh, we some of us are still skeptic, uh, skeptical about AI, uh, our ancestors, just to remind you, were also concerned about electrification of the society. Uh, about 100, more than 100 years ago, and they were having the same conversation that some of us are having right now is, will electricity take our jobs? Will electricity kill us, right? Uh, but our experience of using uh, these artificial intelligence algorithms in at least in geosciences have been a very positive one. And uh, uh, today I'll talk about some of those, those things where you know uh, previously some of the problems that were considered very hard to solve, uh, now we could solve them very easily or there is uh, an additional way of solving them with, uh, with much more ease than previously thought possible, right? Uh, so that, that is something I will be covering today. Now, if you're new to this domain of AI or machine learning or deep learning, and you may hear some talks, they're talking about using these terms actually interchangeably. So some of them will talk about AI and some talks will talk about machine learning and so on and so forth, right? So what what uh, is the difference between these, these three terms? So essentially, uh, machine learning is, is a subdomain of artificial intelligence in which we design algorithms that are able to learn without being explicitly programmed. And when we are talking about deep learning, this is even a further subset of machine learning in which we are only talking about uh, technologies such as artificial neural networks that learn typically from vast amount of data, right? So today's talk will be around deep learning uh, mostly, but I've done some work on machine learning. So, you know, I at times use uh, these words interchangeably as well, right? And, and later on, I'll try to clarify what does this word deep means as well, right? So just to make sure, you know, all of us are on the same board, 
uh, on the left of your screen, you'll be seeing uh, this 1980s era neural network, right? So you would have heard a lot about uh, neural networks by now, but let's just quickly uh, take a look at how neural networks work and you know what is the basic mechanism here. So let's imagine you were trying to solve a problem where you have certain images, uh, I don't know, maybe of, of, of all the US presidents from the past, right? And you're trying to classify them, right? So what you would do is you would build uh, a neural network to, to solve that problem, right? Uh, and it will have uh, three different layers, at least three layers, which means one is the input layer, then you have a hidden layer, which is in between the input and the output layer. The input layer will be used to feed the input images and the output layer will be used to get the output. That is, you know, you input an image of, of uh, George Washington and, you know, you want uh, the output to say, you know, whether it is uh, George Washington or somebody else, right? And we start typically with a randomly initialized neural network. And what that means is that each of these neurons have connections with each uh, neuron in the next layer, right? So each input neuron will be connected to each of the neuron in the hidden layer. And similarly, each neuron in the hidden layer will be connected to the output layer. Now, what are these neurons? So these neurons, you can think of them as just computational units. So if you, if you hone in on this neuron, what it does is it just takes inputs, uh, you know, all of, uh, from all of these input layers, uh, it takes these inputs, which are just weighted sum of values at the input layer. So at the input, you feed some numbers and this connection that you see here, uh, let me get this pointer here, oh, laser pointer, yeah, to make it easy. Uh, so this connection has a weight associated to it, right? So each of these connections that are feeding into this particular neuron have a weight associated to it. And what this neuron will be doing is that it will computing the weighted sum of all the inputs, it will pass it through a nonlinear operation or a nonlinear filter. Uh, which will, and then feed it to uh, the following neuron in the sequence. So then it will be fed to here and to all other neurons because it's a fully connected neural network. So that's how it works. Now we typically assign these weights, which are, you know, all these connections to be random in the beginning. And then we do this training process, which means, you know, you feed an image of, of a particular president. Uh, and it, if it gives you wrong output, of course, it will give you wrong output in the beginning because these weights are not properly tuned and then you will begin the training operation. That is, you will say to your network, okay, I don't like you know, the weights that you have right now, uh, go back and update the weights and you know, you're not giving me the right answer. So what happens at that moment is there is a tug of war mechanism, uh, mechanism between these different weights, right? And this tug of war mechanism will go on until you know, uh, we have converged to the solution or your neural network is, is trained, which means these weights have been properly tuned and your net neural network at that point, you'll say, has been trained. Now we could do very little things with uh, neural networks of the 1980s uh, and the success of, of this deep learning technology is uh, thanks to the possibility of stacking these hidden layers, uh, you know, one after the other. So the word deep actually uh, is, is defined as any network that has more than one hidden layer, right? Um, so the revival of this technology, there was, there was a long, let's say, a winter of, of AI or neural network as they call it, uh, but then it uh, came back, you know, towards the late uh, 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 20th, 21st century. Um, in, in the first decade towards the uh, later part of it. And uh, it's, it was because we were able to tr effectively train these deep neural networks, which was not possible in the past due to computational resources and also um, you know, algorithmic deficiencies, which we overcame uh, as a community. So what happens now is that you have these, these multiple layers which are now able to learn more finer features. So if you're feeding an image, uh, you know, at the input layer, it just looks like, you know, values on the, on the grayscale, uh, right? So it's, it's from zero to one, uh, and these are just pixel values, right? Uh, which are fed to the input layer. The next layer, what it does is it combines these pixel values and creates some sort of lines or some sort of, um, you know, small shapes out of this, which are then further combined in the following layer to part of the eye or parts of you know uh, human uh, 
facial features, right, which are then further combined into more abstract features until uh, they are that the network is able to identify. So this is really the power of deep learning that it could learn very abstract features from your data, right, which was not possible uh, in the in the 1980s. Uh, and therefore, if if you want to think of you know intuitively what happens or what is the power of this deep learning is such that if you have a piece of paper and you have uh, points marked on piece of paper like crosses and circles and you want to separate these crosses and circles but you know to to separate them it will be very difficult to draw this boundary right and deep learning allows you to fold the paper uh, which helps you uh, separate you know these different classes present in your data much easily than ever before um, so this was just to make sure, you know, all of us are on the same page in terms of the deep learning technology and uh, what it does. Now I'll provide you a quick glimpse of uh, personal research interest here. Um, and, and I will try to quickly go over the different topics that I'm involved in. I, I know that uh, this is a very diverse audience and I think uh, one of these topics may match uh, your interests as well. So, uh, so I think I would, I would love to communicate and, and discuss more about these. So the first topic that I'm going to just uh, uh, go past very quickly is that what we have developed recently in terms of detecting micro seismic events using deep learning. Now, if you look into the literature, uh, people have been working on, on uh, detecting you know, uh, low magnitude events uh, using deep learning for induced seismicity applications. Um, and detecting micro earthquakes as well. Uh, but essentially what they do is they look at a single sensor, three components at a single sensor. And what we have done is that we have this data from Groningen and it, where you know the flexibility you have is that you have this, uh, this network of sensors, which, uh, which has, let's say these, uh, these velocity sensors at varying depth levels. So you have four velocity sensors and one accelerometer, which was pretty noisy, so therefore we ignored that. Uh, but you have these velocity sensors at uh, different borehole levels, right? And what we formulated was, you know, uh, that uh, we can separate uh, events from noise very easily if we look at the move out of these events, right, across these borehole sensors. So of course, uh, if you have some kind of activity going on uh, near this borehole uh, sensor of the station, it would appear if you were looking at a single sensor as an event, right? Uh, whereas if you look at the, the move out, then you can distinguish something that comes from above to something com that comes from below, right? And this is this is an example of an, a true event, which you know appears first on the on the on the bottommost sensor and it travels upward, as you can see, uh, indicated by this first break line indicated by this uh, red line here, right? Whereas if you are looking to separate it from noise, and this is very difficult in, in a micro seismic environment where uh, you have very small magnitude events, then you, you can very efficiently do that because this thing here is coming from above, right? And therefore this is most likely not uh, energy coming from the subsurface. So this is something that is um, under review right now and uh, this, this is enabled by deep learning. Now you can do this automatically, right? Uh, previously, one of our collaborators was doing this, this visually to, to verify whether something that their algorithm detects as an event, for example, STA, LTA, or template matching or not an event. But now with deep learning, you can automatically do that, right? So, so convolutional neural networks are very good at uh, doing these visual tasks. If, if, if in your research you are doing something that requires visual inspection, then give uh, consideration to convolutional neural networks. They may be able to uh, you know, help you in your, in your uh, task on your research. Uh, the other thing, and this is one, the one uh, project that we did with Dennis, and in this one we are trying to, you know, still on the micro seismic front, but what you're trying to do is to locate these, uh, these events, right? And we applied this to the Woodford gas shale reservoir. So in this case, we have um, a feed forward neural network, something that I showed you before, um, um, you know, when we were looking at this example with the US presidents. So this is a feed forward neural network. A convolutional neural network is, is something which is slightly different. It's, it's a, let's say a bit more complicated than a, a feed forward neural network. Uh, but the good thing is that it extracts features as well. And it's good for visual uh, tasks. 
But this one we have for this work is, is an artificial neural network. So you feed travel time picks that you've recorded and you output location coordinates. So in a, in a 3D model, you will your output will have uh, three neurons, right? For X, Y, and Z locations. And, uh, and we managed to get very good location and in near real time uh, uh, in this work with Dennis. Um, another thing that I'm involved in uh, here is in terms of digital rock physics. So, so what we are interested in here is, you know, we take, uh, we're trying to to lower the time of the CT scan. So we have these these rock samples that, you know, uh, we do this CT scans to to understand different properties and maybe to you know predict uh, rock properties like porosity, etc. And also our interest is in studying, you know, temp, uh, increasing the temporal resolution to study dynamic phenomena like, like flooding, right? How things evolve, uh, but you cannot wait for seconds to do your scans. So what you see here on the left is uh, an example of a scan taken for 0.5 seconds. So it's, it's, a, it's a low quality scan. Whereas what you have on the right-hand side is, is a one second scan. So you need more time to improve the quality. As you can see, uh, you can better see the features in this image. Now, what we did was we collected a bunch of images like these ones and, and these ones. So we ran the same sample for 0.5 seconds scan and also for one second. And then we fed it to a computer, uh, to a convolutional neural network and we asked the neural network uh, to learn the mapping from left image to the right image. So that, you know, once this neural convolutional neural network is trained, it could take in the future 0.5 second scans or maybe lower and produce uh, a good quality image in, in almost real time. So the good thing is that once these networks are trained, they can give you real time performances, right? Uh, and therefore you can get, you know, in, in fraction of a second, this kind of image, which is, you know, uh, uh, obtained through CNN. And, you know, the good thing here is that it also removed this kind of uh, Poisson noise, uh, from this image, which was present still in the high exposure scan. So, so this is one application in the field of digital rock physics. Um, if, if there are some geologists here in the audience, so we have an active, let's say, research going on in, in the geology field, where, as you know, geology is, is heavily based on visual inspection, and, uh, and therefore it relies on a lot of, uh, let's say, human interaction and their personal uh, interpretation of things. And therefore we are trying to transfer that knowledge uh, to a convolutional neural network, which is can we teach what an expert geologist knows in his head um, and, and reproduce that through a convolutional neural network. So what we are trying to do is, you know, to study different problems like bioturbation analysis, uh, facies classification, porosity prediction. Um, and, and we have a paper on this under review as well. Um, and I think the good thing is that it would reduce, you know, uh, errors due to human attention, differences at different times of the day, right? So if you ask a geologist a question at 9 a.m. in the morning versus at 4 p.m., you know, you might get different answers. Uh, and, and therefore, the performance of a convolutional neural network, of course, would stay consistent, right? Uh, and this way, we could use the time and effort of, of our geologists in, in more intellectually demanding tasks, right? Uh, and, and this is what we're aiming for here. All right. Um, so... Up till now, I've, I've shown you four examples of our work and we are still working on some, some other applications in geothermal, which I didn't include here, which was about uh, predicting temperature um, uh, in reservoir using you know, spring water samples. Uh, but essentially they are based on the same scheme, which is you know, learning from the data only, right? Uh, but learning from the data comes with its own problem, right? And I know that there are uh, people who are strongly against machine learning or deep learning because they, uh, feel like we cannot throw away all the physical laws and governing equations that we have discovered during the past, you know, uh, several centuries and just rely solely on the data. And I, I totally agree with that, right? And, and if you look, you know, if, if you search online of, you know, problems with data science methods or problems with machine learning, you might find some of these examples as well, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here quickly. So this is the example of, of Google Fruit Trends, which was, um, you know, a, uh, an algorithm that was set up to predict the onset of flu just by looking at, you know, the search history uh, or, or on, on Google, right? It was not based on the, the knowledge of how diseases are spread. And it performed well until the year it was 
used to train the model, but it very quickly started overshooting and, uh, and, and sometimes it would overshoot by a factor of more than two. And it, it, it performed so badly that, you know, the, the, uh, the people who put it together had to scrape it, the idea and it, it, it's, it's no more there. And, uh, and, and you would find other different articles that talk about problems with big data. And, uh, and, and I, I, I totally agree with what, what these issues are, right? As you can see, we cannot totally ignore how diseases spread in this example, for example, by just solely relying on Google search history. Now, another example that would be a funny one is uh, that uh, this comes from, um, from Scotland where um, an AI, uh, based algorithm was controlling the camera, right, uh, in a soccer game. So it was its job was to track the ball and, and move the camera, right? And it kept switching between the ball and the ball referee uh, because it, it kept thinking that this is perhaps the ball. And these, these things may happen, right? Um, and while we may laugh at this right now, but things can be catastrophic. Think of self-driving cars if something like this happens, right? Um, the car crashes into another vehicle or into a person just because it wrongly recognizes the object. Or in, uh, in, in medical diagnosis systems, right? Nowadays, uh, we're moving into diagnosing diseases through these algorithms. So, so these things, these you know, uh, fatal accidents may happen uh, if we solely rely on data. And therefore, in, in the rest of today's talk, I'll talk about some of our, of our effort in how we can integrate you know, physics in this neural network framework. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples here. The first one will be about travel time modeling using physics informed neural networks. And the second one would be about, would be an example of tomography. Um, so the first one would be about solving PDEs. So if you guys, some of you guys are interested in, in solving PDEs, I think this in general would be relevant to you. I'll specifically be talking about the iconal equation. Now the idea to solve PDEs using neural networks is not a new one. It's been around since the 1990s actually. But recently, uh, you know, uh, it, it got a lot of attention and there are many groups in the world right now working on developing uh, PDE uh, solution uh, based on neural networks. So this was you know, inspired by the work of Mazia Raisi in 2019 that was published in the Journal of Computational Physics. And, and they called this the physics informed neural network framework. Uh, basically, uh, the, I, th what made difference from the 90s to now is something called algorithmic differentiation, the ability to compute efficiently compute derivatives of your output with respect to input, right? I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit and, and why that idea was, was very useful. So in, in, in this study, we develop a, a pin-based uh, method to solve the iconal equation in a holistic manner, uh, which means, you know, uh, over the years there have been progress on solving iconal equation, but people have been attempting to solve one component of things. But with pins, we can actually target all those components with a single algorithm. Um, and the proposed method could actually use information gained from one solution to the next. Now, if you are uh, solving either wave equation or some other forms of equation for modeling, uh, typically you would need, uh, you know, to repeat that uh, modeling for either different velocity models or different, I don't know, source positions or something like that. Uh, but here now, uh, the good thing is that we could use the information gained by solving one problem. And I'll show you some examples of how we can do that, right? Uh, so coming to the problem of iconal equation, it's a, it's a first order hyperbolic partial differential equation of the form shown here. Essentially what it says is that the gradient of travel time uh, arrival surfaces is inversely proportional to the velocity. And if you are, let's say, uh, thinking of, of earthquakes here, so let's say there is an earthquake and here is your receiver, the time it takes uh, to, to the actually the time it takes for the first P wave to arrive to this receiver will be given by your iconal equation, or you can model that using the iconal equation. This is the boundary condition, which says that the travel time at the source location, of course, is equal to zero, right? And that's how you can calculate the travel time to your receiver. Now, what we do here is with neural networks, instead of solving the actual iconal equation, we solve what is called the factored iconal equation. So instead of solving for this guy, capital T, we solve for tau. Uh, and we have this, this factor T zero, which is the solution uh, in a homogeneous velocity model. And we could com easily compute that, right? Using analytical formula, uh, leaving whatever the, the error is in tau and we try to calculate tau. Now why this is a good thing is because if you're looking to solve for this T field, there is a singularity at the 
source position. And neural networks typically struggle with uh, capturing that singularity. And therefore, if T0 could capture that singularity, which it does here, it leaves tau as a smooth function, as you can see here. And neural networks are really good at approximating these kind of functions pretty fast. And therefore, it gives us uh, a new form of our iconal equation, which is, looks slightly more complicated. But to be honest, it just involves a few more terms. Our unknown is now changed to, to tau. Uh, and we have t0 uh, uh, in, in this. I think this, this it's a typo. It should be tau, not tau sub 0. And we have our updated boundary condition, which is tau at the source is equal to 1. So if your model was already homogeneous, and then T0 will capture everything, right? And your tau will be just one everywhere, right? But if, if not, then it will capture the effects of that uh, as you know the scaling factor of T0. So T0 is known analytically while we solve for tau now. So how do we use neural networks now? Now I've shown you an example of, of neural network when we were talking about um, you know, just those example of, of, of um, figuring out images from, of, of a US president, for example. Now we have a similar form of a neural network here. In this case, you know, we let's say we're solving the 2D iconal equation. Uh, so therefore we have two input neurons for X and Z positions. So what I want is if I feed X and Z positions from within my model, my neural network should tell me what is the travel time factor at that location, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. That is, I'm trying to, I'm hoping that I can train a neural network when fed X and Z locations, it can give me the travel time factor value tau to some approximation, right? And, and the way we can do it is now, if, if, if some of you were used to supervised learning problem uh, or, or data science based learning problem, uh, we don't use any equations over there, right? What we use is, is examples or labels, right? That somebody has labeled the data set for us that, you know, when this is the input, this should be the output, right? Uh, and, and we cannot rely on that here because we don't have the freedom to know what is the solution right now. So therefore what we rely on instead is the PDE itself. So what we do is actually uh, this randomly initialized neural network, when we feed these locations, it gives us some random solution which of course would be wrong in the beginning, right? And, but we anyway, we go ahead with it, we feed it in the equation and we get some residual. It will not satisfy the iconal equation, rather it will give us some error. So this term here in the loss function now actually uh, is, is a sum over all the training points. So you, you select some training points from within your domain. Um, it can be on a regular mesh. Uh, typically people solve you know, these equations uh, using finite difference mesh. And therefore you could use those points or a subset of those points. And this it would be a summation of all the residuals over all those points, right? Uh, and the other is the boundary condition, right? So you're asking your neural network to continue to train the neural network, which means update the weights until this residual is minimized, which actually means until you are able to solve the iconal equation, right? So instead of directly solving the equation, we are solving an optimization problem to minimize this, this loss function or this loss term, right? And, and hopefully if we are able to train the neural network, our solution should satisfy the iconal equation. So let's see, you know, in, in, in a summary how this would work. So you feed, you take a bunch of points from within your domain, right? Labeled as X stars, Z stars, feed them through your neural net, randomly initialized neural network. Your output is, is garbage in the beginning, but then you initiate the minimization or the optimization procedure, which means you are now trying to minimize this loss function, which is obtained by feeding this, this wrong solution in the beginning, right? And some other variables, which is uh, your known travel time fact, travel time solution T0 and its derivatives, which are part of the PDE and the velocity, of course. So this is a modeling problem. You assume that you know the velocity. And once you know this back and forth optimization process goes on and once it's done, you now have a trained neural network. And this trained neural network is now fed all the points within your domain. So you want to evaluate it within a domain and you have some regular points on a regular mesh, you feed those points and it instantly tell you what the solution is at those locations. You multiply them by T0 and you get your approximate solution uh, for the uh, original iconal equation. Now, what's a good thing about this is that 
uh, I, I joke about this that, you know, in, in my PhD, I spent a couple of years actually solving the anisotropic iconal equation uh, for the TTI case or tilted transverse isotropy. And it took me, you know, a lot of time and a few sleepless nights to come up with that solver, which is based on the fast sweeping method. But here it essentially means if you have done this thing, if you have solved the isotropic iconal equation, you just need to update this guy. Everything else in the algorithm stays the same. You just update the loss function now. Now you plug in a different PDE, right? Corresponding to the anisotropic iconal equation. If you want to incorporate uh, attenuation, now you plug in a different PDE and, and that's all. You just change a couple of lines in your code and, and it works perfectly fine. And we have done this with the anisotropy, pick iconal equation with, with for, and we've done it for, for shear waves in an isotropic media. We've done it for attenu attenuation uh, as well uh, in an isotropic media. And it, it just speeds up uh, you know, your research that you could solve all of this uh, problems. And some of them were really, uh, let's say unsolvable and people would do some sort of approximations and solve it for some simple models only. But now you don't need approximations. Uh, and and you know, the debate would go somewhere else, but I would uh, not go into the detail, but maybe I could explain in, in, if there is a question on that. Um, uh, so let me show you some numerical tests and try to convince you that this method does work. And it's based on uh, several of our recent publications. This first paper uh, will very soon appear. It's been accepted in computers and geosciences. Uh, this other is, is a book chapter, which is on the anisotropy part. And we have a couple of other submissions to EAG on uh, other advancements. So solving more complicated problems that were thought unsolvable uh, before you know, using pins. So let's start with a simple model, our tests. So this is a vertically varying isotropic velocity model. And let's have a source here in the center. And let's try to compute solution using uh, our neural network approach. And, and let's compute the error. So you know, we, we compute the solution and with a reference. So now for this model, we have analytical solution and we can compare the error. So on the left, what you see is the error computed based on the pin method, right? Or the neural network approach. And as you can see, the errors are in the order of 10 to the power minus five. So very small errors here uh, because the function was, was pretty smooth actually. So this kind of models are very easy to solve with neural networks. Whereas uh, if you solve it with a fast sweeping, which is let's say the most popular conventional approach, or let's say the, the state of the art that most people use right now, if they were to solve, uh, solve the iconal equation, either fast sweeping or fast marching, uh, you will see these errors, which are more on the diagonal, right? Uh, and, and increase as we go away from the source. And this is typically coming from the finite difference mesh uh, because you, because of the error in approximating the uh, derivative using finite difference method, right? Um, now, what we can, what can we do with this, right? So we can, you know, compute solutions with with good accuracy. Now comes the more interesting part. That is, we could now bring in ideas that were not possible before neural networks could be used. So the, one idea is transferred learning. So let's take the same model, but 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 maybe I, I have added here a horizontal gradient, right? So throw in a horizontal gradient, moved the source position here to the top left, added some anisotropy parameters. So this becomes a TTI model. So what I solved over there was the isotropic case, right? So what I'm interested in asking is, now instead of starting from a randomly initialized neural network, which takes time to train, right? Can I start with the neural network that were trained for the previous example? Can I converge, will I converge faster now? Okay, even though I have changed a lot of things here. Uh, and the answer is yes, here is the solution on the left. Again, the errors are, are very small, much smaller than what you see with fast sweeping, but the more interesting plot is this one here. So if you were to start training your neural network randomly, you would get this blue curve, right? Which would you know slowly converge to the solution. Whereas if you start with the train a neural network, uh, even though it was trained on an isotropic problem, you would converge much faster. So that's where you know uh, you could save cost, computational cost on, on training, right? Um, and let's see what else can we do with this. Uh, another idea is surrogate modeling. Now this is something uh, like uh, building an analytical solver. So you know, in, if you're doing uh, micro seismic source localization or seismic imaging uh, problems, you want to compute solutions corresponding to hundreds or thousands of sources, you know, depending on your model, right? So can we build a neural network 
that we not only feed you know, points within the computational domain, but can we also feed source locations and it gives us travel time instantly, right? Uh, so that's the idea of surrogate modeling. So what happens is that you know, we select some source locations within our model. And you know, if you're working on micro seismic, uh, you typically have a small patch, a small area um, from within which you would try to compute candidate solutions. So you could you know, uh, select some locations from within that region and train your neural network on those. And once it's trained, it can compute solution for a new source actually anywhere within this model. Right, so you could now compute solutions in, in real time uh, without having to train an, another neural network. So here's a solution for a new location, which was randomly chosen here. Um, and, and this solution is, is without any training of neural network. Now, the network is trained already. You just feed uh, a new source location and, and boom, it gives you the solution. It's still much more accurate than fast feeding method, even without training. So these are kind of interesting things you could do to, to you know, uh, save on computational cost. Uh, other things you could do is, is that fast, uh, let's say finite difference methods, of course, have problems with incorporating topography. But here, this is a mesh-free method. So you can select training points from within anywhere. So you could select points below a certain mesh, and it, it doesn't matter to the method. It would still give you very accurate solution compared to, uh, to fast sweeping. So just to summarize the first part of this talk, uh, on solving PDEs is that we've seen how neural networks can be used to solve various forms of the iconal equation. I haven't gone into the detail of different forms of the iconal equation, but I'm happy to discuss later on in the questions and answer session. Uh, but, but that is where I think the real value of neural network lies in solving problems that were, or solving PDEs that we haven't been able to solve effectively or we use some sort of approximations uh, that are far from realistic uh, you know, scenarios. Uh, the method is mesh-free and can be used to solve PDEs using randomly selected points in the computational domain. Uh, it can handle topography easily. Uh, as I mentioned, more complicated iconal equations can be solved by simply updating the loss function. Um, significant speed up is possible by combining transfer learning and surrogate modeling. So that's one advantage, of course, but I think the bigger uh, impact of pins would be in, in, in solving, uh, PDEs would be in, in solving problems again uh, that have been very hard to solve so far. You can easily deploy you know, uh, uh, your codes on various platforms in architecture. So you know, if, if you're working with conventional methods, you would not need to write a separate code. If you're write, using it on GPUs or you can use it using on a cluster, you're using multiple CPUs here, it's based on TensorFlow. The same script would work whether it's CPU, GPU, or cluster. Um, there are some challenges that we are actively working on addressing. And this is when you have sharp heterogeneities in the velocity model. Uh, the network struggles to run them. It takes a lot of time to, to train, right? So that is one thing where this community of pins are still working on it. So it's, it's a it's outstanding challenge for all the, you know, the smart people out there. Uh, this is where we can contribute. Uh, Hyperparameter selection, you know, how do you select parameters? How do you select how many number of layers you want? How do you select number of neurons, right? Uh, how do you select the learning rate? All of this is, is still a challenge. Uh, we need clearly defined guidelines, right? For people to adopt this technology. Multi-value travel times, right? So uh, you may have solutions, you know, you may have models that could give rise to multi-valued travel times. So we're still working on, on those aspects. Uh, if you want to play with, with this implementation of the physics informed neural network, you could look up, uh, look, um, you know, my GitHub repository, feel free to take a snapshot of this, uh, the screen here. And, and play with it. And, you know, I'll be very happy to, to, to collaborate or answer questions if you have in terms of, you know, working with the code. Uh, I haven't talked about this, but we have also uh, published some work on solving a wave equation in the frequency domain using pins. So, so feel free to take a snapshot of this paper and uh, this details the, uh, the method. So essentially the idea is, is very similar. It's just a different partial differential equation, right? Uh, solving uh, for the wave equation. Okay, so I'll move to the second part uh, in, the, in this domain of physics and form solutions. So this is about travel time tomography, right? So in the previous part, we just were talking about computing travel times, assuming the velocity was known. How can we invert for the velocity, right? And what are the benefits of doing so? 
So conventional tomography uh, techniques, they typically suffer from several limitations. And one of them is the use of a smoothing regularizer. So those of you who work with ray tomography, they know, you know, you as, as, as a side of, a, uh, of this, you get imprints of these rays, right? Uh, of this ray path, right? And which you would use heavy smoothing to get rid of. Um, and those of you who are using adjoint state method, you still get some signatures of the source. Um, and, and I worked on the adjoint state method, so we would still use some form of smoothing regularization to, to not only to uh, get rid of these artifacts in the solution, but also to, uh, to cover for the ill postness of the problem, right? Um, uh, and also, you know, for these methods, you need an initial velocity model with some given depth gradient, and you know that your final solution would depend on this. And sometimes we see some funny solutions that physically do not make sense. Uh, and they are an artifact of your choice of the initial model, uh, which is of course not very obvious in the beginning um, for certain problems. And difficulty in dealing with models having irregular topography that can be dealt with very easily here. So in this case, what we are going to do is we are going to use travel times observed at seismic stations. And we are trying to not only use that uh, in the loss function, but also we will use a physics informed regularizer. So we are saying we don't use a smoothing regularizer, but something called a physics informed regularizer. We'll bring in physics here to cover for the ill poseness of the problem. Uh, and the physics informed regularizer will be formed by the residual of the iconal equation, right? So let's see how does this scheme looks like. So we have two neural networks now instead of one. The first neural network is going to output travel times. It takes, uh, it, it is very similar to that surrogate model I showed. So it takes points within your computational domain and source position, source location. So you can have maybe, I don't know, 10 shots and you would train over all those shots for multiple points within your domain. And this model will learn to predict the correct travel time for each of these sources and for, for all of these points, of course. Whereas this neural network will learn to predict given a point X and Z, a velocity, right? So of course, velocity would not vary with these uh, shots, right? Uh, short locations, therefore we don't have that as the input. Now what binds them together is the loss function now. So let's carefully look at the loss function. So the loss function has three terms. The first term is a summation of over all sources and receivers. Uh, and this is the data mismatch term, right? So you have some observations at, you know, boundary of one of the boundaries of your network, typically at the surface, and you want to minimize that, right? So your neural network predicts some solution, you want to uh, minimize the residual with respect to what you have observed. Another thing is your boundary condition. So you want to also ensure that your solution matches the boundary condition, right? But the other thing, which is actually the regularizer here is the, the iconal residual. It's the iconal equation itself here. Uh, it's it's uh, summed up over all the sources, of course, and the training points. So you've selected certain training points and you want to make sure the velocity and the travel time solutions that you get, that is the travel time solution you get from this network and the velocity that you get from this network, they are, uh, they are able to, uh, let's say, minimize this, this term here, which is the iconal residual. So they follow the iconal equation, right? Uh, this, is, this is a thing that is different from conventional tomography schemes. And we simultaneously train uh, both, both networks using a single loss function. Okay, so let's take a look at some numerical tests here. Uh, we start with an example of cross-hole tomography. These are both are synthetic examples. This is something very recent uh, work and therefore we're working on extending this to real problems or to field problems as well. So here we have 11 sources here distributed e evenly on the left part of your model. And we have 51 receivers here spaced equally again on the right side. So you shoot from here and you record here. Um, so this is your true model. Here is the initial model. Of course, in this case, we don't have the choice to come up with an initial model because it's given by our uh, initialization of the neural network. And uh, here is the inverted model, which takes only six minutes on an NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU, um, which looks, which is very good in terms of approximating the smooth part of your solution, which is of course what you, aim for from travel time tomography. So we are not aiming for all these, you know, uh, sharp variations, uh, whatever you may see here, but we are uh, looking for, let's say the smooth or the uh, macro features in your velocity model. Uh, so here's a comparison from 
two profiles here on the left uh, here, as you see, is from x equals 0 0.4 kilometer. This it was the initial velocity. Um, black is actually the true one, which is trying to copy, and it does pretty good job of approximating. So later on, you can use the solution with a full waveform inversion approach uh, if you want higher resolution, of course, uh, which is which is typically the objective here of doing this. Um, and again, at some other you know profile, we get similar behavior. Oops. Uh, these are the travel time fits that we observed at uh, for a couple of different shots, and we can see here, you know, towards the edge we get some mismatch, uh, but overall it looks looks pretty good in terms of the travel times, right? So the black is the observed travel time, and red one is the predicted, uh, the final predicted, of course, uh, from the final velocity model. Uh, this is an example of surface tomography. You have this velocity model with which is pretty, let's say. Uh, vertically varying velocity with kind of uh, a velocity bump here. Uh, we have 51 uh, sources equally spaced on the surface and 126 receivers. Um, these are the results here. On top is the true model. Here is the initial model. Uh, ray tomography would not work uh, with this kind of initial model uh, because it needs to start with a gradient. So you have to provide some information about your model, right? Whereas pins do not, uh, do not, is not, let's say, dependent on the initial model. So you, it's, it's based on random initialization. It works with a uh, very different model. It kind of approximates very well uh, this bump as well. Of course, there are some errors here, uh, but the idea is not to uh, build the model with very high resolution. It takes only 20 minutes compared to if I was using a joint state method, it would take plenty of time actually for, um, for I don't know, 51 sources I had, yeah. So travel time fit after the solution, again, towards the edge where you, you come into the problems with this, uh, let's say coverage issues, you have some small travel time errors here. So there is there is plenty of room for improvement of this uh, approach here. Um, and, and maybe some of you guys are interested in non-seismic methods. That's, that's what you can also combine here uh, with this, which could be pretty cool application and um, you could do uh, those kind of things as well. So here we have demonstrated the use of neural networks for the travel time tomography method, just to remind you that uh, we approximate the travel time factor and the velocity field using neural networks subject to the physics informed regularization based on the iconal equation, in addition to, of course, satisfying the observed observe travel times. Conventional methods, as I mentioned, use some sort of smoothing regularizers, which are not based on physics, and therefore they end up, uh, let's say, compromising on the resolution, whereas here, uh, with only a few sources, you can get very good resolution. Uh, and this approach is very well suited to study temporal vari variations. So once your neural network is trained, now you have new, let's say, observations, six months or a year from now, you can quickly uh, update the method, update your neural network and find your uh, updated velocity model. And this also gives you actually a very compressed uh, version of your velocity model. So if you're working with a huge velocity model, your neural network can now approximate that. Uh, so it's, it's, you can think of this as a reduced order representation of your velocity model. So if, if, if that is of interest, you know, for some applications, you can think of neural networks as an additional advantage for that. I would like to acknowledge my collaborators on this physics informed neural network work uh, and, and their contribution have been uh, really uh, very meaningful in, in what I've showed to you guys today. Um, and with that, I would like to end my presentation here. If you are interested in learning more about some of the applications I showed to you earlier, I have a YouTube channel, which we'll just uh, look up my name and you will find several of those videos. Uh, thanks to COVID, you know, we were moved to online presentations. I took this opportunity to put on those presentations on, on YouTube and share it with, with the community. So feel free to to look, look up those presentations. And if you are interested in you know, uh, communicating or asking some other questions um, or something, you know, feel free to contact me by my email. So thank you everyone.